Dr. Rebecca Scott, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about your research, uh, which um, I discussed in the intro, but just to kind of mention what I was interested. So your research covers looks at adventure sports. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, so like, which has just been phenomenally popular over the last decade, probably, would that be mm -hmm. about right? About the yeah. Last yeah. And, you know, we hear about all the positive kind of... Um, positive feedback of what it does for our mental health, our bodies, our physical fitness. But what I thought was really interesting about your research was the way you framed it, looking at pain and why people consume pain. Um, yeah. So literally they'll, they'll sign to these experiences, pay big money, put their body through the realm. Absolutely. Yeah. For a painful experience. So I loved that angle and I wanted, I was dying to chat to you about it. So, um, can you tell us why do people pay for pain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Really, really excited to be talking to you about this weird and wonderful subject <laughs> that's been, yeah, getting some attention. Uh, so I should preface and say that, so this project was from my PhD uh, thesis um, and it's a, it was a group project um, that I did with Julian Kayla and Bernard Kova. So we took an anthropological approach to studying pain. So we looked at the social, but particularly the cultural aspects of pain consumption in the Western world. And to do so, we really kind of honed in and asked who, who chooses to pay for these painful consumption experiences. So we were looking at why do people choose to pay for physical pain and a consumption experiences through the lens of Tough Mudder? So for those of you that don't know Tough Mudder, it's a really grueling adventure challenge. It involves approximately 25 military style obstacles and participants have to do a myriad of all different types of sensory challenges. So climbing walls, running through burning hay bales, wading or being immersed up to the neck in torrents of mud, uh, slithering through really tightly enclosed spaces. So as well as pain, it really pushes on all the fear buttons for people as well. And then of course, the quite famous obstacle um, is electroshock therapy. There's actually two obstacles like this where you, uh, yeah, get, you crawl through 10,000 volts of electrical wires. <laughs> um, so we really like this context because it is Amongst other things, such as being a team experience, it was really sort of explicitly marketed as painful and, and participants are well aware of that as they go in. So not only participants, but actually the spectators as well sign a death waiver. Wow. So in kind of looking at why people do this, we kind of looked at, okay, who's doing Tough Mudder and what are, what are their lives like? What is the culture like that they exist in? And we really interrogated their work lives and we really considered the reduced physicality of the work life and specifically this office urban life um, and the kind of boredom of the contemporary work practices that a lot of these mother participants were engaged in. Uh, and we talk about the kind of worries and constraints that they experience as a lot of us do. Um, and yeah, and it was, as a result of this, it kind of creates what we called like the cubicle bound masses sort of yearning to break free. And we use um, a term called the knowledge worker to describe this sort of person. So someone what was that word is, you said there? Cubicle? Cubicle bound masses yearning <laughs> to, yeah. Lovely. Like little, like, um, like battery style chickens oh, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a symptomatic of, you know, our Western world. So we conceptualize um, most of the people that do tough murder as knowledge workers. So these are people that are very highly educated, highly skilled, but very specific skills, you know, often in, you know, consultancy, uh, cognitive work, so high end cognitive work. Okay. And for these guys and academics are totally included in this, <laughs> this sort of <laughs> sensory intensification, um, specifically through pain or different forms of pain, it brings the body into a really sharp focus and allows people to rediscover a corporality that's essentially got lost and certainly backgrounded for most of their in most of their sort of day-to-day -day routines but yeah that's really interesting because we are leading more sedentary lifestyles 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So by opting I don't know, in, do I t- take offense to being compared to a battery chicken? But my, no, that's a bit of a. No, it's no, amazing though. It's a that, brilliant. That comment you know, didn't go into the paper. That's my kind of music. No, I, I, I like it though, because if you think about it, like sometimes we are contained. If you, if you think about those who do, you know, sit at their desk, make their way to their desk and maybe log in at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and it could be nearly 10 hours just. Yeah in that kind of sedentary position though. Yeah, and especially if you think about and you break down like the commute situation in a lot of cities. I mean, I was doing this primarily in Sydney, um, but if you were to do this field work in London and cities like that, if you look at how people actually get from their home to their office, that's a real, you know, you're you're not only in a cubicle you don't even have your personal space if you're on the London underground so I'm, pic- I'm picturing the uh the tube with all of us squashed in like like little battery oh, hens gosh. again into the yeah. cramped spaces then to go into our cramped little office space oh god yeah so- I mean my my mum and stepdad are farmers and I'm I've I've done some farming with them and I see how they legally have to load sheep and the space that sheep need to have when they're loaded on a trailer and it's more space than we have as developed, civilized, Western knowledge workers going into our buildings, you know. Really? Yeah. Oh well, so so that'll be one one um, kind of benefit of social distancing. We, yes, we and I can speak forced. to that because I was in London last week and it was a very different, very peaceful, very relaxed experience. Yeah. So we um, have to have one meter at least, or two meters of space around us. So uh, uh, maybe one positive. Yeah, all this. No, that would be lovely. Yes. But, but yeah, what we, what we essentially found with this pain project, so looking at why people pay for physical pain, was that through this like sensory intensification, it brings the body you know, back into a sharp focus. And by flooding you know, our consciousness and our bodies with this pain, it provides like a temporary relief from the burdens of um, self-awareness and can even re- create some kind of uh, reflexive escape and... Um, yeah, and there's some really interesting sort of theories around pain. So we drew quite a lot um, from this French anthropologist, um, Le Breton, and he talks about pain being an agent of metamorphosis uh, and helping people to understand um, understand their bodies more and specifically understand the limits of their body. So I think for people who are relatively disembodied, it's, it's quite valuable um, in that respect and can become like, a symbol of renaissance uh, and letting people to let go of their everyday concerns of their um, yeah yeah no lives. like i what i you know that that phrase like no pain no gain and yeah I, you know, I i i really think sometimes we need pain to remind Actually. ourselves that we are living yeah like a hundred percent if, if, if when nothing's wrong, we're taking everything for granted. We're using our body as the vessel of transport gets us from A to B. We take it for granted. But it's not until you have some sort of ailment that then you're consumed with that ailment. And if only I didn't have this Im- Im- impairment, then my life would be better. Yet when we don't have that pain, we're just all walking around taking it all for granted yeah. and maybe not minding the body that we're in. A hundred percent. And I think... Um... Pain is just our body speaking to us. I think we've, I guess, extreme pain, of course, hurts, but I think it is just a form of our body responding. And, and I think it's a good way to listen to the body. And we do certainly, we're quite good at listening to pain and we're probably quite good at listening to pleasure. But I think as a race, we're not incredible at listening to everything in between that sort of duality. Um, so I think by these types of experiences, particularly when they're multi-sensory. So Tough Mudder, as an example, is multi-sensory. Yes, you've got the extreme bouts of pain. You've got different sorts of pain. You've got like the low-lying, you know, soreness of muscles after the event, but you've also got some, you know, pleasurable, you know, swimming down a river or scooting down a big um, mound of hay bales and swinging on a trapeze. Like you've got so much going on there. And I think that's what's quite nice about these events. It, It teaches us to connect more with our bodies and I think our bodies hold a lot of intelligence in that regard so I think having set your own dialogue with your own body is really important for wellness yeah and the other thing that you mentioned there about um, escape and the idea of escapism and that came true a lot for me when I was reading your research about this you know and it really made me quite sad to mm-hmm. to think of of this kind of lifestyle that we've created for ourselves where we're yeah. looking to escape from it yeah. And no wonder these adventure sports are are taking shape and um, gaining p- kind of prominence because there's so many of us stuck in a lifestyle that we want to escape from. And 
when we think we've only one life, it's really, really sad. Yeah. That's what came across from me. I just felt, gosh. Actually, do you know what it was? There was, um, there was a quote of a guy who had come, who won, won it from the research. Uh, James, I think he went from one yeah, of the- Yeah, he's fans. a classic. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. And he just captured the mundanity of, of life so well when he'd just done like the tough mother, he'd come away, got back into his car. The kids were shouting in the car. They were going on their way to Tesco to do the shop. That's it. And he wondered when could he sign up to do it all over again. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, I think it's escape into the real. Like we, we, we talk about, we position it in, in relation to the escape literature in terms of Tough Mudder and the pain being more of an internalized, um, like it has this immediacy that pushes inward sort of escape. Um, but yeah, I mean, this study and many others like it have, uh, they discuss the, the value of, I think, escaping into a more natural space, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it being kind of in touch with nature, but with the connected of the pain um, and that kind of escaping, what, what did you say? The cubicle? Cubicle bound masses. Cubicle bound masses. Um, <laughs> I, chick- we could just call them the chickens. The, chi- the battery chickens. <laughs> and yes. I refer to that affectionate, affectionately because I am I'm one of those chickens. So I'm afraid, chicken. yes, there are days when I am too. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I guess we're, all, we're all there. But um, I couldn't help but think of the movie Fight Club when I was. 100%. Reading. This is Fight Club through and through. Yeah. It, yeah. Like when was it? Fight Club was probably, is it 20 years old now, that movie? Yeah, I feel like it was around 2000-ish. Mm. Yeah, so it, like it was already capturing the frustration of this like, absolutely kind of boring, monotonous, yeah. computer-based lifestyle that yeah. has emerged in the last yeah. what, 30 years. And a kind of grey, drab, like washed out reality of your nine to five. Yeah, they, they encapsul- encapsulated it beautifully they really really did yeah yeah so it, it, it all makes sense that these adventure races are just multiplying and the participants are multiplying of, of looking for that escape from yeah. less physical lifestyles less physical jobs and mm-hmm. we're looking to kind of find kind of just li- a lifeline somewhere else where we can actually feel more in touch with our body yeah and just feel more real and I like that you brought up Fight Club because I don't know about you, but when I watched Fight Club like 20 years ago, it did seem like quite a shocking scenario, like this notion that, you know, we have our regular lives and then people voluntarily go beat each other up in, you know, underground car parks or wherever it was and they get a thrill out of it and it makes them feel alive and real. I remember feeling it was it was quite confronting in a way, but and I think what's interesting is how much like I think that we have evolved a little bit from finding that quite confronting to actually seeing that in a way that is legitimately quite therapeutic and normal for a, for a lot of us. It's not everyone's cup of tea. It's not everyone's way to escape. Some people want to read a book and that's their internal escape or, you know, they want to walk the dog. And I think we all have our own means, but I think there's, and Tough Mudder is really testament to this, as is the, all the competitors such as Spartan, that there are a lot of people that really value and need to escape through the body I think some people are very embodied and some people aren't embodied at all but I think what's beautiful about Tough Mudder and similar experiences it provides an outlet for us to to you know explore more dimensions of our physicality through pain yeah yeah and it, it, like they are super and it is great and it has given us an outlet but something I was thinking about um it seems like you know and even reading the research and thinking about that idea of we'll go, we'll do that race, you know, we'll train for that race and, you know, we'll have the euphoria and the, the training, whatever t- it happens over a weekend. Mm-hmm. And then we're back into that sedentary lifestyle right. again. And, and that's just has been the nature of the rat race of the nine to five yeah. Monday to Friday rat race. And again, coming back to the current times that we're living through where uh, most people are working remotely from home through COVID-19 um, I mean, trying to see some sort of uh, silver lining in what is a really horrific time for everybody. Mm. Um, is that idea of, I, I feel like, I don't, don't know if you sense this too, but maybe just from watching social media feeds and just li- listening to friends, almost that there's the possibility now of, uh, of maybe merging that active lifestyle within our daily lives, as opposed to it having to be, oh, you know, just... Uh, packaged up on a weekend and then we go back to 
uh, five days a week of crap mm. like that we don't actually want you know of, of this awful commuting and just can't get off the little hamster wheel and I feel like now like even for myself like you know rather than spending from 7 a.m to 9 a.m racing around catching trains yeah. dropping kids off uh, you know trying to meet deadlines making sure I'm somewhere on time everything's much more fluid like I can get up and run in the morning or I can you know yeah. do a bit of uh, yoga or stretching or um everything's much more relaxed and it's there's a fluidity what what do you think about that are you feeling that as well yeah I absolutely am and I think what's nice about this fluidity as well is where I, I think like we're becoming more independent and self-directed in terms of our own sort of health and well-being and work-life balance so rather than turning to the marketplace to do our exercise whether that's a gym or a rowing club or a holiday whatever it might be I think people are taking it into their, not just their exercise, but also their health um, into their own hands. Um, so yeah, I think the global pandemic has, it's kind of been a paradigm busting time in multiple respects, like work, relationships, diet, travel, and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me, it's, it has, it's conjured up lots of different um, ways of self-directed you know, health, um, and lifestyle changes. So one example uh, would be at the start of lockdown, I did uh, an introduction to essential oils class uh, with a really good friend in Sydney, Australia, and was super, super inspired by the sort of supportive power of essential oils, not just in terms of emotional support, but also physiological support. It just completely blew my mind. And these are sort of specifically certified therapeutic grade essential oils. Um, so I quite liked, you know, not that I get ill or need to go out to a hospital much at all, but it was quite nice kind of learning and feeling empowered that, you know, if I, if my immunity is low, I know what I can do. Or if I have an upset stomach, I know what I can do. Or if I'm feeling low energy one morning, you know, I know what oils I can turn to, um, to support me. And it's completely natural and completely safe. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much into a blended Eastern and Western um, sort of medicine approach. Uh, so that's something that I've quite liked in terms of reestablishing my work-life balance and where I, yeah, where I kind of place my priorities and, yeah, no, I, and I do think, we, like, again, probably with with um, the pandemic, realizing that, you know, people, I know we don't know yet exactly what, what, what who's more vulnerable, but definitely re the early research seems to be saying people with uh, various health problems, maybe yeah. obesity. And they're all things that, you know, people have to individually look at themselves and go, okay, like, what can yeah, I do? Yeah, it's very self-reflexive time, isn't it? And that's confronting, I think, for a lot of people. So which is getting people out and about and kind of into nature, which is fantastic. And, and people on bikes, like I'm sure it's the same in Ireland, but like in Wales and England, like bikes are just got to join a wait list for, to get bikes. Like people are just, yeah, getting out there and riding bikes in a way that they weren't before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I like think hopefully now government um, kind of will take, take the lead on this and recognize, you know, we need to support this more of mm. kind of that healthy. Yeah, I think they are, aren't they? they yeah, yeah. Scheme. We've got a few kind of greenways being and uh, mm. cycleways kind of got the go ahead. So which is fantastic. So I know help everyone but even like the, the holidays i mean i guess you know we can't go on our, our fab glamorous holidays abroad no. anymore. Heart's broken. <laughs> still broken yeah but i i love what people are doing like you know hitting off and like say around ireland now big thing yeah. is uh people doing sunrise mountain climbs so it's not even they're making the most of what we have here the kind of beautiful nature that we have so yeah. doing the various nature uh, mountains but even like kind of making it a bit more fun by doing a sunrise one. So yeah. like meeting at 4 a.m. at the foot of a mountain and kind of catching the sunrise and or sunsets in beautiful kind of uh, lake districts. And, you know, we're just trying to kind of make the most of it, but getting back in touch with nature. And I think it's, you know, definitely a big plus of, of kind of the, the pandemic. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Mm. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to pick up on something else in your that I loved in the in your research. Where so you're talking about so obviously these are kind of experiential kind of um, what experiences that people are con consuming. But you used a term, and I was like, oh, and I kind of got carried away with the term. But you said experiential resume. Yes. 
Oh, I love that. Um, so I can't take credit for that. <laughs> that is, um, that's a term, but, but thank you. Yeah. So that is a term um, coined by uh, a couple of wonderful um, marketing researchers, uh, Keenan and Kavet. They did a paper um, in the Journal of Consumer Research called Productivity Orientation and the Consumption of Collectible Experiences. Um, and I, as you know, I'm a real advocate for experiential consumption, be it, you know, professionally, personally, and I just deeply applaud this paper because I've just got a supercharged passion for the importance of creating like a repertoire of different experiences. So what they mean by this uh, experiential resume or the experiential CV is uh, basically in their research, they uh, examined why consumers desire unusual and novel consumption experiences and why they voluntarily choose leisure activities and vacations and celebrations that are predicted to be less pleasurable or even in some circumstances painful. So for example, consumers might choose to stay in a freezing ice hotel, uh, any in restaurants serving peculiar foods like bacon ice cream. And the authors propose that such choices um, they're driven by consumers like continual striving to use their time very productively and make progress and reach certain accomplishments, i.e. this idea of the productivity orientation. And they argue that through these sort of collectible, these novel and these extreme experiences, it leads customers to feel productive, even when they're engaging in le leisure activities. So they can kind of check off these certain items on their experiential checklist and and build up this um, experiential uh, CV, which is sort of driven by this um, productivity orientation. So, yeah, yeah, you yeah. could kind of flip it on its head and and sort of see the, the the types of consumers that like to, you know, always go on the same beach holiday to Spain or even luxurious holiday in the Bahamas. And this is just the flip side of that. It's like, okay, that's one dimension and that's very pleasurable dimension, but we want to we want to expose ourselves to more, yeah, more variety. It's yeah. variety so, seekers, isn't it? But what I was thinking, you know, like there's going to, there's a shift towards in, if you think about, so we're talking CVs, resumes, and, and, and this being the kind of next step in terms of CVs, resumes, experiential resume, like, you know, with soft skills becoming more important for employers, I thought, mm. wouldn't you know, it'd be really interesting dimension if CVs were to evolve into that'd be amazing, yeah, very, yeah, because you'd have it, great fun as a student building that up. <laughs> but but I think it would it would really help people to think about you know creating more mm. uh, interesting lives and and um, do you know just experience you know actually realizing the value of of having a more active and adventurous lifestyle. Mm. You, you think about it in terms of, so like if any, any interview process that I have set in, um, I'm way more interested in seeing what people's kind of hobbies and interests are. Yeah, hundred like, percent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. You work there. That's great. And, and if they don't have interest in hobbies, it's like alarm bells. Like, why don't they? Like, yeah. Who are you? Are you going to be yeah. to work with? Like, so I, I just think, um, you find out so much more about a person and, and yeah. like a, anymore, like we're, a lot of the jobs, um, there's going to be processes in place. You're going to be able to do it with some, you know, anybody with any level of ability usually will be able to do the job, you know, and get a training process. But the soft skills are so much more important now. Can you work as a team? Are you an independent thinker? Are, you know, can you think critically? Are, you know, who are you productive? Do you mm. have a sense of resilience? And I'm going to find that way more if you tell me you've done a Tough Mudder race and I'm yeah. like, okay, tell me about that. Yeah. That's, that's where you're going to really hear the person. On, on that note, and I know I'm transitioning from the work context into the, I guess, the consumption of love or the romantic context, but there is, we didn't explore it, but it is part of a phenomenon of Tough Mudder. And speaking of this, you know, notion of the experiential CV, like if, guys did Tough Mudder. I don't know if it works with girls impressing guys, but it was certainly something that was kind of lauded and used a lot sort of on the dating apps. And you still people, see people, you know, proudly wearing their Mudder t-shirt as a, you know, because they felt, it, you know, it said something about them. I found that oh. quite interesting. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So using it as... It's like uh, an impressive thing to say to a girl on a date kind of thing. 
But I suppose it is. It's kind of an yeah. element. It shows kind of something. It's better than talking about the weather, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, the weather or I watched a match. Like, you know, well, that's not really very interesting, yeah. you know, but but tell me what you've done or what you've got involved in or can I get involved too? You know, yeah. you'd, be, you'd be a much more inspirational person. So I definitely think there's a pitch there for evolving the, the regular CV to include an experience. I think that's a really cool idea. And I think um, like, as, like in practice, I think it's done to a degree like with the Duke of Edinburgh and the gap year things that we put on our CVs to make us interesting to universities or employers. Um, I don't know how much research is done in the area, but converting what Keenan and Kvetz has done in the consumption space and putting it in the workspace, I think that would be quite a fun academic project for some... Co converting you know. what who did, Zayt? Um, the oh, converting oh, what Keenan and Kvetz did. So yeah, taking that notion of, yeah, the experiential resume, taking it from the, the consumption context and putting it in the, the you know, having a management scholar or two, you know, study that. I think that would be a really cool yeah, research project. Just come up with a new research project. Yes, <laughs> I actually have management co-authors. I can give them a nudge. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so um, for Tough Mudder, you actually, when I love this, that, you know, you weren't just the researcher observing, you got stuck in. <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell me about it. Oh goodness. So this is a funny story. So I think I mentioned earlier my uh, co-author and he was actually was my second PhD supervisor, Julian Kayla, an amazing um, ethnographer. So I remember quite vividly one day, and I'm kind of like a little bit of an innocent, naive PhD student, really kind of just getting my head around what ethnographic immersion uh, in a field site really means and entails. So we're kind of walking down the corridor at UNSW in Sydney, which is where you know, I did my PhD. And we're, he's like, yeah, so right, we're, we're happy, we're clear on the research question, why do people pay for physical pain? Yeah, good, clear on that, okay. And we've, we've got quite a nice context, we've got tough mudder. Right, and now the research, how are we, right, so, you, so we're gonna do ethnography, yes. Gonna do ethnography. And it's slowly, the penny's slowly dropping, and then I, I kind of turn to him and I'm like, so I'm, I'm doing, the tough matter. I'm I'm getting electrocuted. Is this what this means? And yeah, I was well, just I'm glad we've got that cleared up. <laughs> oh gosh, it was it, it was to be honest, it was such a relief to know because I'd already done field work prior to this in offshore yacht racing, which actually gave us the research question. So it was just so much just to get that juicy research question established. By that point, I was just so keen to get going with the research. I just um, sucked it up, and I was. I am from a very sort of sporty family. I grew up with mountain bikes and windsurfers. Um, and windsurfing, when the wind picks up, if you're out at sea, that is very challenging and quite literally have been out my depth many a time doing that. Right. So I just kind of thought, how bad can it be? Can it possibly be worse than, you know, being on broken windsurf kit, being swept out to sea in a gale where no one can see? Probably not. Probably can't be worse than that. Um, but still, I was, wasn't completely like really excited because at that point I think it was about 2011 and Tough Mudder was very new and I was engaging in field work with Tough Mudders in Sydney Australia and like I say Tough Mudder was very new no one had really debunked that yeah it's painful but it's actually really really safe it's very controlled it's essentially a two-hour event so I'm interviewing people and there's a lot of trepidation anticipation fear so when you immerse in a community that's going through all those emotions and asking them really to unpack those emotions, it does set off those same feelings in you. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a challenge and I was very conservative and sensible about preparing because I, I love sports so much. One of my biggest fears is being injured or not being able to do sports. So for that reason, I'm quite careful and conservative. So I just ran around the Northern beaches in Sydney to make sure I could do the, the amount of kilometers required, which I think was about 21 off the top of my head. And then I would run into the sea and get immersed in the sea and then carry on running because you're in and out of the water obstacles. I wanted to have kind of familiarity and, and practice with that. But there's, there's no preparing you for the 10,000 volts of electricity that surge through no, your big no. joints in your body. Like I wasn't about to go pushing my wet fingers into any plug sockets to get exposed <laughs> to that. Um, yeah, I don't think that would be advised. Not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> wow so uh you you i think i saw or i read in the research did you do 150 pull-ups in preparation was there something about you doing yes so 
I can't remember if it was Julian or Bernard, or maybe it was a bit of a group discussion, because quite a few of the Tough Mudders are also CrossFitters, similar okay, type yeah. of exercise. So I think one of the boys had the bright idea that I should go and immerse in CrossFit to not to study CrossFit, but just immerse in the types of people that I again then going to do Tough Mudder. So I was living in Tucson, Arizona at the time. I, um, yeah, I was working for University of Arizona. And anyway, I went down the road to my local CrossFit gym. And yeah, we basically, we did a warm up for about 10 minutes on the rower. And then all we did the whole session was pull-ups and squats, pull-ups and squats, fast, furious between the two. And then there was no cool down and I should have known better and done my own cool down. So I do take responsibility for that. But because we didn't cool down, my muscles seized and I couldn't straighten my arms and I couldn't even open my fridge. I couldn't hold a heavy glass of water. I couldn't open my front door. And yeah, well, thankfully I had amazing friends in Tucson that are Chinese medics. So they were giving me herbs and all these things. But for about two or three days, I couldn't straighten my arms. That was... <laughs> It was that when there was a there was a photo like of your your arm there and exactly like dandelion. yeah what was yeah that? dandelion something? it was it was like a, a dandelion like a serum like a rub I think to warm up the muscles I forget I forget oh. the detail but yeah wow okay so you so it was like pain body. before pain during and pain after but all different sorts of pain <laughs> yeah absolutely but interesting like you're a lot of physical body preparation. Yeah. But I feel like in the in the research, there was a lot of kind of body and mind kind of duality in terms of you can prepare your body, but your mind is actually what's going to get you over the line, isn't it? Like, yeah, you know, 100%. the psychological preparation. Definitely. And especially when you're facing those obstacles that are setting off fears in you. So for me, I don't consider myself someone who's scared of heights. But I'm trying to remember how high a lot of these jumps were. You'd scale a wall and then you'd have to just, yeah, you'd have to jump off walls. You'd have to jump off ledges into water. And when you're just free falling, I mean, it's at least 10 feet, maybe 15 feet. And it looks really, really far. And you're not sure how to do that. You're not used to how you should land. That's really confronting. And also what was confronting is like the claustrophobic elements of some of the obstacles. So when you're in these really, really tight, water pipes essentially that are just big enough to you know for a, a larger person to get through but they're still very tight and you're they're at an angle and because this these tubes that you're I guess army style wriggling your way through they're full of people so you can't see the other end um so occasionally you might get a glimmer of light and be like oh, okay that's the length of about a tennis court or a tennis court and a half and then you've got mudders running on top of you and an obstacle that's going you know, overground and you're going underground. And then lo and behold, when you do get through this pipe, you don't just get out the other side, you fall into a big water pit. So you're often at a funny kind of angle and then you've got to plop out like a baby being born. <laughs> There's a lot of quite um, birthing. I mean, one um, obstacle is actually called birth canal. And you've, again, you're scrambling on sort of dry mud and they've got these big, heavy, sacks of water like almost like big bodies on top of you and you've got to scramble and push under these big bows of water so yeah it's very it's embodied in that regard and we didn't really interrogate that side of it in the study but yeah they really they get you from all sides yeah wow yeah but you know to to push yourself through like to kind of i just think that like some of the some of the respondents or participants like they were talking about you know having to overcome the mind to get through it and there was one um and i just totally i could relate to it because only recently i i had been on a run up and i hadn't intended to run up a hill and I was like, oh man, like, I can't believe I've after, I, I, I took rookie mistake. I took this route, like where the hill was uphill and I was running up and I was so busy telling myself, I really did not want to be running up this hill mm. that when I looked down, my legs had stopped and I, I hadn't even, I didn't mean to stop. I didn't say stop yes. running, but I, I had just stopped. And I just like, oh my God, that's because I'm tell my mind is yeah. telling me telling me to stop. And I was like, it, yeah. no, no way. I was like, you get running again and you get back up that hill. Like, but it was just a weird yeah. kind of where I realized I didn't control my legs stopping there. Yeah. It, it's so it's so best for my brain because I was so negative, was like kind of sent it, you know, that's kind so, of that's so explicit as well. 
Yeah. I remember doing a spin class in Sydney and the spin instructor, he was like an ex Olympic cyclist and he was incredible at getting into the head and he would literally, he would tell you your body can always do it. It's only your mind that will stop you. And he kind of, he was like an earworm. He really got in your head and really had you believing that your body can do anything. And it's just, and then he would almost help you support you in resetting your attitude and your mindset to how much you could push yourself. And oh my goodness, those workouts were the hardest workout you've ever done because you just, you, you believe what he's saying. And I think that's, that's, I'm sure that's how they train these elite athletes as well. Yeah. The kind of mind and body. And so your lifestyle is, you've kind of mentioned there, your family, your sporting kind of, you would have a lot of influence in terms of family influence of a sporting lifestyle. What, what is, you mentioned windsurfing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, f- a few things. So I guess, um, so windsurfing and biking, mountain biking were like sports I grew up with. So I had a couple gap years before uh, doing my undergrad at Bath. Um, so I taught windsurfing in Greece and Turkey for a couple of years and then continued through my undergraduate. And then, yeah, so I think it, it's definitely in my blood and I just really enjoy wherever I'm living at the time. I just enjoy experiencing that space through the sports that I can do in nature. So uh, for instance, in Sydney, like it was the windsurfing and yoga and running on the beach. Uh, in Tucson, Arizona, beautiful desert scapes, so fantastic hikes, very available and high quality yoga. Uh, one of the best cities in the US for road and mountain biking. And then in addition, so I've, I've been in Cardiff for four and a half years now. And one thing I like about Cardiff is the river. So I've got into rowing and that's just a really fantastic, immersive engulfing experience, particularly rowing at night, funnily enough, because you, you really could be anywhere in the world because the river beautiful. mouth kind of. Rowing at night, that sounds beautiful. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of essential because it gets dark at four o'clock, right? In the winter. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to row in the winter, I mean, if you don't leave work till five, six o'clock and then you've got to get there, I mean, it's, it's very dark. So you have your lights on the boat and thankfully the skies aren't pitch black at that time. They're kind of blue. And then you've got these beautiful tree silhouettes. You've got the moon and the stars and it, it really, really is a magical space. And like, we're talking about escape. Like it's, it's yeah, very, it's all about escape that river. Yeah. Well, and I love, I love the, the, that you're aware of your, connect with nature in all of those sports i was only i was just listening to um i was listening to a podcast recently they were talking about the swim run are you familiar with the swim oh, run no. it started this? up in sweden where they kind of do uh, lads kind of as a dare first of all but it, back 15 years ago and it's it, it's expanded and i think there was one in devon last year okay. um yeah so it spread from originally starting it's so i think you run in your wetsuit you swim but you're part of a team but okay. i know there's a lot of advocates of just you know they're realizing that connection with nature with the water mm-hmm. that just brings a vitality and and, yeah. and realizing and the positive ions right. particularly in moving water there's some really interesting research and workshops on that kind of yeah and, and, and also free is it not, is sw- natural swimming or free swimming has become quite a big thing now as well since What's lockdown that? just swimming just swimming in nature wild swimming that's it wild, wild swimming. swimming is that the whole wim hof of the Wim Hof. Yes, yes, definitely Wim related to Wim Hof. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. talk about Wim Hof. <laughs> Wim Hof, he's, he's really uh, taken off, hasn't he? But like, yeah. it's just become so popular here again of this early morning swims. There's so many people around Ireland, well, around, I know, locally, our local uh, beach. There's a oh, good wow. few of us like down there. I'm even getting on board as well. Of oh, just so those. good. And uh, like, it, you know, doing things that you wouldn't have done before, like at the start of the be- summer, I was on the beach. I had no interest getting into the sea, but mm. a couple of friends were saying, come on, we're going to go 7am, we'll go down to the beach. And it was just probably that communal idea that of mm. meeting some friends. And it's so fun, like, especially when you're squealing and it's cold and some yeah. people are right in there. Some people are wussing out. Yeah, oh, totally. Oh, oh no, the w- wussing out is not an option. you got to get in there. <laughs> You have to go in and you have to go under. Yeah. 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 Again. Do it properly um, or not at all was a new experience for me and we've been kind of doing that and it's just lovely it's become really yeah. and like you do you feel so alive okay I lose circulation for the first hour afterwards and my fingers but then afterwards it really helps your body 
yeah but that you know and you know no pain no gain kind of like yeah. um, okay well you know i can put up yeah. with this uh, for what's happening for my body like it's given me such positive energy for the day to get through it yeah. and i think and like to turn immunity. to nature yeah. yeah to get through like you know so this is kind of during lockdown but you know there's all the kind of difficulties confinements but turning to nature and natural resources and habitats 100%. to actually yeah to revive me for the day of kind of okay now i can face into you know family life or you know kind of yeah. whatever i have to do today um it's just really worked for me and i i, I just I just love that. So I love that you, you've been so aware of that connect and you've really used the different terrains to try new sports. Yeah, connect. but I, I am aware, but I'm not aware. I wasn't aware of it until I was thinking about this podcast, actually. And I was like, huh, yeah, that is really true. That is, as a footnote, I would say I also, food is another way I like to sort of enjoy the spaces that I'm living in. But yeah, it was only since this podcast where I really started to reflect about the sports that I've, I've been doing in different parts. Um, so cool so at the, at the moment what would be your kind of go-to um, and... at the moment what I'm doing is lots of yoga so a mix of flow and and yin so yin is incredible for recovery and then I'm doing a couple of circuit training sessions with my rowing club um, a couple of times a week and then hopefully when our restrictions lift we'll be able to get back out in the boat again I was supposed to be going windsurfing in Greece next month I don't think that's going to happen oh. but I've slightly resolved it because I'm going windsurfing and paddle boarding and sailing in Abbasock, which is a cute little village and beach town, I guess, in North Wales. So quite excited for that in about a week. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. So we're like, it's like we're discovering kind of what we can do in our local, yeah. local areas. Like I know so many people have said to me, oh, I never even realized that beach was there. I didn't even know that park was there. I was the same, discovered like new local kind of yeah. areas and, and nature reserves that, that I just hadn't gone to before. So, so funny, isn't it? Yeah, there is a lot of positivities of, of that. Um, okay, so uh, with your holistic kind of lifestyle, do you have any kind of um, life hacks or daily practices that you could share with us of, of what kind of keeps you fit, healthy, focused? Yeah, motivated? definitely. Lots of life hacks, lots and lots. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, I'm a wellness advocate for doTERRA essential oils. So I guess starting on since lockdown that has been a really sort of important part of my sort of daily wellness self-care routine so um for example i might start the day with a drop of lemon and some warm water to get really hydrated after like a long night's sleep um i might diffuse peppermint while i'm at work or you know some citrus in the morning to keep me really awake um i've got a lovely work blend for focus um, i've just bought spearmint which is great for clear speech so with our jobs, we obviously do a lot of presenting as academics, so that's a really nice one. And so yeah, that's the essential oils. I also start my day every day doing 10 minutes yoga, mm -hmm. followed by about six, specifically six minutes breath work. So I do <laughs> Joe Dispenza's um, breath work. I'm not very good at breath work, but I do appreciate its value. So I try and do that every morning. Who's that? Joe Dispenza? Joe Dispenza. Yeah. So Joe he's a, got lots of different meditations and, and breath practices. Nice. Um, and I do the yoga and the breath work because in the past I have, you know, suffered from anxiety. Um, so I find if I just do a little bit of that every day, it just kind of keeps me really grounded and and would you say breath work is similar to meditation or is there a distinction? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like the sort of breath work I'm doing, you kind of, um, it's very, you use your internal muscles starting, you know, at the base of your spine going right up to the top of your head. And it's almost like a, a roll, like a, you kind of hug, you know, your belly to your spine. And it's, so it's, I wouldn't say it's as tranquil, it's more active than a meditation, but in terms of the focus, and the clarity of mind is, it is like a meditation. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I'm, I'm, I'm here doing it. <laughs> I'm yeah. here trying to I'll do send you the link. Coffee. It's really interesting. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite a weird one. It's quite hard as well. It's quite. Yeah. Well, I do find that like, if, you know, whenever I try to kind of chill out and do a little bit of meditation or breathing, um, I, I do find it hard just to sit still. 
yeah and do it but so it is when they say a practice it really is oh, 100 percent. and yeah like my yoga teachers he sometimes does the yin classes where you just hold poses for five minutes and he's so right in saying you know this is harder this is harder than the powerful vinyasa flow where you're always moving and you're always stimulated like this is hard because you just have to sit with yourself and deal with what comes up and try and keep your mind clear so yeah i think those more the quieter practices are for sure you know the yeah i'm, I'm kind of slowly coming around to being convinced i'm much more of a you know if i'm gonna spend an hour i want to train or you know i've got to yeah train hard, you've got to sweat you, you know that's yeah. training um but i'm really more and more as a little get a little bit older realizing actually there's so much value and, and you will get so much more back in terms of mind body if i just sit still for a little while and learn how to do that so i'm trying I'm yeah. fine. <laughs> and I think, I think doing both is really important. I think doing one or the other, I think it's, yeah, I think it's great to do both and they really complement each other. Yeah. 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 So that's you. So you do the little bit of yoga and the breath work. Yeah. So lots of things. So yeah, the yoga, the breath work. And then after I've, you know, had my shower and had my breakfast, I then write every day, I write a gratitude letter. So this is really inspired by a book called The Path to Wealth, Seven Steps. And it's essentially about your neural networks and kind of setting them up for success at the start of your day. So what I would, how that works is I would write down an inspirational quote. So for example, I subscribe to um, the inspirational speaker, um, Abraham Hicks. They do like daily inspirational quotes on email. And I've written down today's one, which is... <laughs> which was uh, be less focused on the problem or question and be more focused on anticipation of the answer and solution. So they're all about being in the mindset of being satisfied with what is and really sort of excited and eager for more of the same, basically. Um, so yeah, so for example, I would write that quote down and then I would write a letter and give thanks and gratitude to everything that is already in my life and everything that I want to manifest in my life. So I might be like simple things like, thank you for a secure job. Thank you for great weather. Thank you for safe, easy train travel today. Thank you for getting published in the journal of consumer research. Like, so you have that feeling in your body, like in your, in your gut and then in your brain. And then I sit and read it and then I go through it in my brain and that takes 10 minutes, but I really find my day is different if I do and I don't do that. And it's easy to say, oh, I don't have time for that. Or I would really like that 10 minutes extra sleep. Maybe that's more valuable. But in my experience that I can't afford, I, I can't afford not to do that, you know, in the middle of the start of the day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can totally, like at the start of this year, I started journaling, um, you're doing the artist's way. So it's three, three pages. Yeah. Um, yeah. Each day. And it's really hard. It just changes you. You know, and I wondered, oh, why three pages? But so you start off and you're just kind of, you can write. And that's the great part of the artist's way. You just, um, it's a 12-week program, but I've just continued on and on doing it like throughout the year. Um, you you can say whatever you want. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know yourself from being an academic. You know, you, you like the fear mm. of procrastination of writing because in case it's not good, in case it's not. Yeah. Yeah. But this, you have the freedom to go, just write whatever kind of mundane kind of banal ideas come into your head, whatever's happening. And it and almost without fail, by the time you get to page and a half, you start making your connections and you start realizing why you've started writing that in the first place. You start reflecting and observing and kind of thinking about what does that mean. Yeah. And it just gives you so much more depth in the day. Like yeah, 100%. So I, yeah, I can see that. So the idea of that gratitude letter, which is lovely. I like the 10 minutes. That's probably more realistic when we go back to <laughs> term time yeah. again. <laughs> I've, I've been, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, I, I, I love the idea. I, and I think it is really, really kind of helpful for creating a more meaningful day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 100%. And more alignment with how best to use your energy and your own resources, I guess, throughout the day. Nice. Yeah. Um, Another mindfulness, not mindfulness, um, but I guess something I've become aware of in terms of a health and well-being routine in my day uh, relates to some research uh, that myself and my co-author um, at USC, Uli Gretzel, have been getting into over the last couple of years, uh, which is just staying mindful and aware of electromagnetic fields. 
Uh, so our study is looking at the consumption phenomena of consumers having no choice. So electromagnetic fields, um, you know, come off natural objects like our bones, our organs, animals, plants, rocks. So that's natural electromagnetic fields. But importantly, unnatural electromagnetic fields, you know, comes off our pylons, our masks, our smart meters, our phones, tablets, all these smart, you know, technologies, transport systems that we're surrounded by all the time. And as a society, we've kind of gobbled up all these amazing tech innovations because it's so convenient and just incredible at saving us time, giving us convenience, everything at our fingertips. But what we haven't been so quick at being aware of is the physiological impact of these electromagnetic fields on the body. Okay. Uh, so our, our study is looking at a group of consumers that actually experience not only discomfort, but quite extreme pain. <laughs> Again, addicted to the pain research. <laughs> um, <laughs> the pain in it, I mean. Yes, yes, give me the dark stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at people that, yeah, really sadly just give up, have to give up everything and remove themselves from society as we know it and go live on remote farmland, remote desert, remote woodland, just to escape from exposure to these electromagnetic fields. Um, There's very kind of consistent symptoms, very consistent research. Um, it's quite a politically charged subject, so I, I won't go into that, but I, I will say that it's made me very mindful of, for example, turning my phone on airplane mode and charging it in a completely different room to where I sleep because of the radiation that comes off our phones. It's not just, it's the regular signal where we receive our phones and text, it's the Bluetooth, it's the Wi-Fi uh, cell signal, and also keeping my Wi-Fi router as far away from me as possible and switching it off at night. Um, I don't have a smart meter because I refuse to have one, but just little things like that, like not exposing myself because I have read a lot of very reputable, very reputable research. And I work with a lot of reputable doctors that are find and scientists that are finding that this absolutely leads to cellular disturbance uh, leading to cancer and cell mutations. So, um, wow that's going off at the deep end, but that is something that I'm very like passionate about. And that I, you know, in the same way, when we learn to drive a car, like we learn like what to look out for. We learn to read the road signs and you don't leave a car running when you're not in it. You know, when you go to bed, you don't leave your car on. And it's kind of the same with how we use our technology. Like why leave your Wi-Fi router on giving out radiation when you're asleep? Like, why do you need it on when you're asleep? And why do we need our phones or those signals coming off our phones when we're not actively using them? So and yeah, I think. Is it the physical distance to the device? That yes, yes. So even um, if you read the small print of our, of our mobile phones, it actually says don't have it within an inch of the body. <laughs> and you think most of us, when we use our phones, obviously we hold it against our heads and we're seeing like new, like different forms of cancer forming on the side of the head, exactly where our, you know, our phones go. You know, there's a lot of um, issues with um, fertility because people you know, men or women having their phones in their pockets um, around, you know, their reproductive organs. Yeah. And, it's and then the pain, what, what, like what kind of pain symptoms have people been So consistent symptoms. I mean, it's it, really bad stabbing pains in the head. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, maybe these people are psychosomatic and maybe they're crazies. And I have, I've done so many interviews. When I say interviews, I mean, afternoon long interviews most of these interviews are with people many of them are academics many of them run very large multinational companies i'm talking about lawyers you know people that aren't you know i haven't dragged these people off the street um and i have been so the first interview i did as an example was with an nhs doctor who is you know trying to raise awareness of this and form a connection between these people that are suffering and the nhs and I was very aware that he was electrosensitive. He was coming to my office, we were doing the interview. So I was very careful to turn off my Wi-Fi on my laptop because I was making notes on my laptop. And about 20 minutes in, we're sat sort of across the room from each other. And about 20 minutes in, he was like, excuse me. He's like, you've got your Wi-Fi on on your laptop. And I was like, no, no, no. I was really careful about that. And I checked and he was right. Because I was so being, you know, when you're so, well, with, anyway, when I'm overly, Diligent, I, I yeah, often get nervous prepared. and mess yeah. up. So I'd clicked it too much and my Wi-Fi and my Bluetooth was on and he could feel it. He was like, yeah, in the front of my head, I'm feeling stabbing pains. I was just, yeah, so apologetic and yeah. And even 
yeah, there's just so many examples of, you know, I've been in the car with people who are electrosensitive and they can feel a mast coming up before it's there. And then lo and behold, there'll, there'll be a mast. And yeah, it's a real minefield for these guys and they're not being listened to by, at least in the UK and the US, they're not being listened to. I've got to say in places like Sweden, in Belgium, France as well, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which is the common name for, you know, having pain around electromagnetic fields, it is recognized by the government. So for instance, if we were electromagnetic hypersensitive and we were in France, the yeah. government would work with our universities to say, give us a low tech lecture theatre or allow us to work from home more. They're, they're amenable. They recognize it as a really, really like impactful condition that really, really hurts people physiologically. Wow. Wow. So we're a bit behind in the, in this kind of. Yeah. I mean, my, from what I've learned from being immersed in this community is that the, that all the knowledge and all the research is there. It's not that it's not there, but for um, economic reasons, or I should say monetary reasons, mm -hmm. um, the consumer public aren't made aware of, because I mean, for, for business, it wouldn't be good for business if the general public knew that all these devices that we love and have been marketed to us as, oh, this is connectivity, this is love, this is how you reach loved ones any moment, any time, this is how we stay connected. It's all about community and relationships and all this, all these stories that have been sold to us about why, you know, phones are so important and, and, and now increasingly with, um, you know, smart devices giving us a framework for artificial intelligence and how we're being sold, how wonderful artificial intelligence is, particularly from a, a marketer's business you know, money saving point of view. Mm. So I, all the knowledge is there, but it's strategically not being made particularly available. Wow, that is so interesting. So you're working on this research at the moment? And yeah, absolutely. So we've done interviews, a uh, little over 30 quite extreme electromagnetic um, yeah, sufferers. I mean, these guys are so sensitive that uh, you know, normally I'd record an interview on my phone. I can't go there with a phone. I have to have a pencil or pen and paper, um, no technology at all. I have to often be quite far away from them. So for example, one sufferer picked me up from a train station and she could feel the um, electro smog on me from the train because, you know, all of our trains and transport that all has, um, and, you know, we're, we're constantly kind of in a soup of, and these electromagnetic fields, you know, coming off our, like our emergency services, um, the radar from all of that, that's all our Wi-Fi. Our... Wow. So um, when, when that research is published, it's going to, you know, really kind of help raise awareness. But when yeah. with your findings, like, and more research is like that of exploring these ideas. Um, yeah. Hopefully, Which of course, probably, you know, when we hear this, we don't really understand it or it sounds kind of bizarre to say, well, energies, you know, and but we accept that we are all kind of energy. We yeah, and this is totally, this is just basic. This is quite basic science. Like I'm, I'm not a whiz kid at understanding science, but this is very kind of fundamental science. So, for example, the notion that, um, you know, we all have electromagnetic fields and the natural ones make like a starburst shape. And then the unnatural electromagnetic fields move up and down. So when our, those fields interact, so when I hold my mobile phone, those fields are interacting. That's what creates a cellular disturbance because there's a, a moving in different in different ways. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I definitely wouldn't know the science behind it, but it's hugely interesting. And we'll have to follow Thanks. up on the uh, outcome. Yeah. Stay tuned. Time, Rebecca. Um, but we uh, have to finish up for today. So uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for. You're uh, so welcome. It's been a pleasure. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, Rebecca Scott, thank you very much.